the data is there for us. You're spending, yeah, nine hours in bed, but but you've got 40 disturbances. Like, what's going on? Women have been left out of research. We don't know as much about female body. Women have basically been treated like small men. Sleep was kind of the greatest natural performance enhancer that we have, right? I think that people have a lot more agency than they think. I think just that mindset that, you know what, like there's a lot of things that I can choose on a day-to-day -day basis that are gonna enable me to perform at a level that I feel really good about. Yeah, performance is a choice. Okay, I'm here with Kristen on the Know Your Physio podcast. Um, I just wanna say, first and foremost, thank you for taking the time and for uh, reading up on me, my background, and what we're accomplishing through Know Your Physio. Thank you for you for your work and your passion and, and everything that you do. And uh, before we jump into exactly what you do and how to develop mental and physical resilience, uh, would you mind sharing with me and my audience why you do what you do? Why I do what I do? Well, I'm really interested in impacting health at scale. Uh, you know, so I think the, I think my whole life I've been really interested in these questions around, you know, how does our mind and our body interact to uh, promote uh, optimal performance, you know, and, and and not necessarily, you know, I think folks are like, maybe hear performance and they're like, oh, performance. But I think, you know, I, I kind of define it as our, our capacity to intentionally behave at a level equal to our physical, mental, and emotional potential. So I think that's, you know, very aspirational, but I, I think that that's, that's really what I've been trying to understand my entire you know academic and kind of applied career in coaching is you know how do we help folks understand you know what are the actual influences that impact our ability to kind of show up as consistently as possible to be able to access uh their their potential as, as a human being and um so that's really that's really my life's work I suppose and why <laughs> my my calling is is to try to help people understand how to apply their effort so they can take control over the trajectory of their their health and their performance. Obviously, you are exceptional at helping folks understand what they have in the tank, what they're capable of, and taking that and 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 unleashing it, right? But mm. why is this something that is so natural to you? Why does it make so much sense to you? If you can take us back through maybe your early life history, mm -hmm. uh, your career as a professional, you know, why does this make sense to you? Yeah, well, I was an athlete myself. I played two sports in college. Um, I played basketball and field hockey in the Big Ten. Um, and then I went on and represented my country for seven years on the U.S. national team. So, you know, this project of trying to understand my body, trying to understand my psychological functioning and and how that laddered up to me performing or not um, was always of, of, you know, massive interest. And then I went on to become a coach. I coached in the, you know, NC2A. So I was a, I was a collegiate head coach for 13 seasons. So really trying to help my athletes, you know, understand, you know, what it is that they needed to do to kind of flourish, you know, on the field, but also off the field. Um, and I really, you know, my my academic background is in is in psychology, like you, and in psychology and physiology. So I was really trying to create a robust performance education that would help, I suppose, my student athletes at the time understand the factors that, that influence their ability to kind of show up. And, you know, we were collecting lots of data. So I was really one of the earliest adopters, you know, using heart rate te derived technology. So uh, I used to heart rate variability. I think I was probably one of the very first NC2A coaches to use heart rate variability in applied setting to kind of as, as a measure of readiness. Um, and then I used GPS. So I was using a lot of external load as well as and subjective load. So kind of the factors of human performance, objective, subjective, and internal. I was taking in a lot of those data. We had a robust framework around, you know, the core psychological needs. So we were kind of tracking a lot of those data as well, those subjective data. And I was creating really a model to try to predict, you know, performance or capability tomorrow, capacity tomorrow. And what I realized really quickly is nothing that I could gather in the two hours of, of that I was with my athletes and collecting a lot of these objective data and subjective data, none of it could really predict how they show up tomorrow. And you know, you could say, oh, my model is flawed, but but I think now I've come to realize, and really one of the reasons why I left Princeton University, where I was where I was teaching and coaching, um, is is because I found this technology in Whoop, where it basically is telling you, is giving you a picture of what's happening twenty four seven. So 
what I learned in my environment at prison is that it's not just the, the the two hours that they're with me or the three hours that they're with me. It's the other 21 hours that actually have more influence on how my athletes are going to show up tomorrow. So I became really interested in these other 21 hours of the day. And, and you know, and, and that's, you know, with the kind of food that we're putting in our body, the timing of the food that we're uh, putting in our body, which we can talk about circadian things, but I'm really, my PhD work is all in kind of circadian behaviors. Um, you know, how we're sleeping, um, our social connections, our hydration levels, um, you know, all of these things are going to to impact our ability to recover and, and, and show up tomorrow. So it's not just about how we're training. It's these other things that um, are equally as important. And, and I think quantifying those things is really the opportunity and kind of where we're at today is that we have beautiful technology that and it helps us understand how we're adapting and how we're, you know, and, and all these factors that we know are most predictive. That's right. Most predictive of, of, you know, optimal functioning. Um, we can kind of track and quantify. We don't have to guess anymore. And it's not just the, that you have, you know, that you can capture more hours, right. When you're not with the athlete, but it's higher quality hours, considering the confounding variables that you're eliminating essentially, you know, when you have an athlete with you in a performance setting, there are all kinds of stressors that are influencing the physiology. And obviously you want to prepare the athlete to be, uh, to perform exceptionally under those circumstances and even more stressful circumstances. But when you remove the confounding variables and you measure, you know, how they're recovering and how they're sleeping, I imagine that you really get a grasp of a, a better grasp of their true potential. Um, and, and so can you, can you actually take us through with the whoop, for example, why, uh, it's so much more important to look at the sleep uh, scores rather than, you know, what's happening throughout the day or immediately before or after performance. Why, why is the sleep, why are the sleep scores so uh, valuable in predicting that performance day in and day out? Yeah. So just so folks know, Whoop is a 24 seven physiological monitoring device. There's no watch base. We're just collecting heart, heart rate data 24 seven. And then um, we have uh, algorithms that basically synthesize that information and give you insight across sleep, recovery, and strain. Strain, how you build cardiovascular load, recover, uh, recovery, uh, you know, you're basically how you're adapting to external stress, all sorts of types of stress that you face in your life, and then sleep, which is uh, to your direct question, um, how you're sleeping. So how much quality sleep, how consistent is it, how much, how sufficient is it, which are kind of the three pillars of, of sleep. But, um, but yeah, I mean, what we saw very clearly is that you know, if you if you look at training in isolation, so volume and intensity over the course of a two hour period, if you're in a maintenance phase and you're working with elite athletes, there's not really a whole lot I can do to them in two hours that's going to move around next day recovery for the most part. What's going to move around recovery the most is how I sleep. So when sleep is really good and I'm training the athlete appropriately, for the most part, they can repeat that pretty consistently, <laughs> you know, you could repeat that volume and intensity um, if they're getting the requisite amount of sleep. So it was very clear to me early on that sleep was kind of the greatest natural performance enhancer that we have, right? And and to not uh, consider it and, and for athletes not to really double down and try to get as good at it as, a, as they can was really a disadvantage. And, and I think in my environment when I was coaching, you know, we really saw sleep as a competitive advantage. We're, you know, we're in an environment Princeton University. It's academically extraordinarily challenging, arguably one of the most challenging academic environments in the world. And we were, you know, we were winning Ivy League championships year after year. We were vying for national championships. We're, you know, a nationally ranked team every single year. So there's, you know, the demands on a student athlete at that level are, are pretty high. And, um, you know, so I think even in that environment, we figured out how to sleep. Um, and and that really, I think, was one of the, the bedrock, bedrocks of our ability to kind of win 12 Ivy League championships in 13 years, right? We had a, we had a, a, a lot of success. And a lot of that was a result of just my athletes being available. And, and I think when we think about sleep and the power of sleep is that it improves your chances of reducing illness, reducing injury, right? And, and allowing you to kind of show up as your, you know, the best version of yourself. So you can actually ap- apply quality effort, um, you know, in, in all of your pursuits. And and when you do that after, you know, over and over and over again, you get pretty good. <laughs> right. So, you know, if we look at exercise and training as this stressor, as a hormetic stressor, we can only truly derive the value of that induced self-induced stress if we can provide the right mechanisms of recovery, the right environment, the right nutrition, uh, time off. But if we can 
not only, I mean, obviously sleeping more can support the recovery, but sleeping more efficiently and having a data driven mm. approach to sleep more efficiency is what makes a difference in deriving yeah. the most from these hormetic stressors. So can maybe before we get into, there's a ton of stuff that I want to cover with you. We have a limited amount of time, but can you take us through what are some of the key takeaways for an athlete to sleep more efficiently? Mm. Uh, and you know, your question. particular area of, of, of research is in circadian biology and mm-hmm. circadian rhythms. Uh, if let's say you have an athlete that's traveling in, uh, across different time zones, sleeping in different environments, mm-hmm. what are some of the ways that they can sleep more efficiently? Okay, well, uh, circadian rhythms are, are basically physical, mental, and behavioral changes that follow a 24-hour cycle. Uh, one of the most kind of, um, I suppose, known uh, kind of circadian uh, rhythms is, is our sleep-wake cycle. So when you travel, your sleep-wake cycle is is really disturbed, okay? And you and what happens is you end up having what's called circadian desynchronization. So that means what wants what your body wants to do. So what is naturally happening endogenously is out of sync with the cues that you're getting from the environment. So if I go from the East Coast to the West Coast, um, and now all of a sudden um, I'm three hours behind the East Coast, it's going to be light out when my body thinks it's dark out. Right. So I'm going to start to feel sleepy um, when everyone else is awake and alert or maybe I need to be awake and alert. So um, so that conflict of the external cues and what's happening endogenously creates what's called this misalignment or desynchronization. And when you do that over and over again, that can cause some pretty you know, negative health consequences metabolically and cardiovascularly, which we can go into. Um, but in the short term, you're going to have decrements in performance. So um, so you need to give athletes the requisite time to adjust to that new time zone. And really, the levers that you want to pull to adjust to your new time zone are you want to view light on that new time zone schedule. You want to eat meals on that new time zone schedule. You want to go to bed on that new time zone schedule. You want to wake up on that new time zone schedule. Um, that all can be really difficult, though, to do, um, especially falling asleep. So um, you need to be, you know, think, you know, caffeine can be a really good strategy. So you might have it at, you know, 3 p.m. on East Coast time or, you know, that which is basically or you want to have it. Yeah, you want to basically just uh, advance the, ca- the caffeine so you can delay your sleep onset. So slow your sleep onset down. Um, so that means, you know, it might be it's, you know, midnight back on the East Coast, but it's, you know, 10, uh, it's 10 o'clock or, or nine o'clock um, on the West Coast. And that's actually when you want to fall asleep. So you kind of use caffeine to make sure that you kind of um, don't fall asleep too early, essentially. So or you just fight through that sleep pressure. But invariably, you're going to have probably a crappy night's sleep. <laughs> um, so with athletes, you want to just um, give them the time to recover. Um But I think back to just what drives sleep efficiency is this consistent sleep wake time. So there's no question about it. And, you know, I've accessed a whole bunch of data and and this is area that I do a lot of research in. When people have unstable sleep wake time, that is, there's a lot of variability between when they go to bed and when they wake up, um, they will have less efficient sleep. So those folks end up having to spend, you know, more time in bed in order to kind of get all the sleep that they need in terms of slow wave sleep and REM to wake up restored and refreshed. So one way to spend less time in bed is 100% to stabilize when you go to bed and when you wake up. Um, And that really does drive our our sleep efficiency. Right. I I recently was putting together, uh, just compiling some of the best and latest research on sleep to create a webinar with my team. And the way that you just described these sleep-wake cycles, I mean... I, I just absolutely love, I, I, I think anyone can appreciate this, but as a physiologist, I just love the way that you uh, made it so practical and, and, and accessible for folks to understand. And so if we, if we go to this um, sort of like uh, resistance or physiological resistance, right? Like as someone is traveling across time zones, you're in this new place and you are doing everything possible to sort of fight against what your body's used to so that you can perform your best in this new time uh, uh, um, uh, uh, time zone. H- how long does that process take to re- return to your optimal, you know, performance or function? H- how 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 quickly can you uh, can you get to this new sort of uh, uh, you know uh, natural balance? It's about one day for every uh, for every hour, essentially. So for every hour difference. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
And do you move incrementally by hours to sort of shift into this uh, new rhythm or do you just kind of do it? Is it like an uh, all of a sudden cold turkey, boom, I'm going from a, an 8 a.m. Eastern time breakfast to a 12 p.m. Eastern time breakfast just right off the bat? Yeah. I mean, ideally you start before to kind days. of shift. Yeah. You start to shift before you travel just slightly, you know, a half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, half an hour. That could be an amazing strategy to basically acclimatize, kind of get your body uh, slowly used to this new time, you know, time zone. So wherever you're going. Um, another strategy is to opt out of the jet lag by not acclimatizing. And we did actually, we did this with a soccer team. We ended up winning the national championship. They were an East Coast team. They they flew out to California and we basically kept them on their East Coast time with all those levers that we talked about. So it was just the timing of the games. You know, they're one o'clock and four o'clock um, uh, Pacific time. So we were able to navigate all of our meals, all of our light viewing, all of kind of when we, you know, when they would naturally be working out anyway on, on East Coast and, and uh, did I say meal timing? And sleep wake time. So we basically kept all of those, like those four most important kind of circadian cues. We kept them on East Coast and we just applied that, you know, that those time frames to to the West Coast. And we actually were able to look at their physiology and so saw no physiological perturbations. So they basically stayed when you look at markers of recovery, like heart rate variability and resting heart rate. If you try to acclimatize for those first four days, first two days, if you're going from East Coast to West Coast, first two to three days, it's going to take you about three days to get back to your physiological baseline of where you were in your home time zone. So what we saw when we did this experiment is we didn't see any changes in their physiology because we kept their circadian uh, rhythms aligned to their home time zone. They never shifted, right? And never forced to shift. Yeah, it was really powerful. So, I mean, when I travel, that's Totally what I do all the time. Like I, you know, to the degree that I can in terms of scheduling my meetings, I basically literally stay on East Coast time. So I, I get there, I, you know, I'll go to bed at like 7 p.m. if I'm on the West Coast, because that's generally I go to bed at like 10 p.m. on the East Coast, um, you know, and it works like literally like a charm. Like I have no physiological changes. I come back home and I'm boom, ready to go. And how about because I know sleeping in a new environment is generally a stressful it's generally stressful. How do you accommodate this new environment so that it's suited for 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 optimal sleep? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, there is some research that shows you know folks who travel like half their brain is essentially still awake. That's why we tend to have a lot of disturbances. And if you're tracking with uh, a tracker, you can kind of see, oh wow, I had like double the disturbances uh, than I than I normally do in my home environment. So you know what you could do when you get to your away environment is um, you know just cold, dark, quiet. <laughs> So generally speaking, hotels have all these little lights everywhere. So an eye mask, I think, is just absolutely crucial. Um, I have like a little, you know, those like little hair clips, like those claws. Um, I bring those to like, so the curtains are like totally pulled together. So there's no little like light. Um, I put a towel by the door to kind of block out the noise because a lot of times like the just the shutting of doors and everything. Earplugs, 100%. Um and then I try to make my room as cold as possible. I actually like there are hotels that are like sleep um, approved, you know, that think about the hygiene in the way that we're talking about and make sure that, you know, the room can actually get cold enough. So the the um, Sleep Foundation now recommend, recommends, I think, like 60, 66 to 68 is an optimal temperature, which is really cold. Um, but that's really like optimal sleeping temperature. So yeah, I try to find like hotels that I know uh, that I've like been to before, you know, chains that I've been to before that I know um, really have all this dialed in. Um, but yeah, that those sleep hygiene uh, aspects are are really important. Yeah, I, I personally set mine to 62 and I'm starting to think maybe it's a little too cold, but I do wake up in the night. I do wake up occasionally and I'm like, ah, man, it's, it's and the end of the blanket. a little sweaty. I mean, Oh, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, sometimes I get some, most of the time I'm, re I'm, I'm really cold and it, and it feels great, but there are times, I think it's when my girlfriend is there, she just has, she, she mm. is like, I don't know, she just <laughs> carries so much body heat somehow. I have no idea how or why, but I think maybe that's, that's the case. Well, to answer the question of what's going on with your, with your partner or your girlfriend, <laughs> uh, there are different times of the month where actually women run hotter. Um, and it's, you know, kind of in the the two weeks for naturally cycling women. So women who um, who are not on hormonal birth control, who menstruate, 
uh, generally speaking, like the two weeks kind of leading into menses, uh, generally speaking, they're going to run, uh, their temperature is going to be a little bit hotter. Uh, so higher. So they, um, they in fact will experience more sleep disturbances kind of in that week leading into menses uh, than, you know, the other times during the month. So that could be why she's running hot. <laughs> it makes sense because she, I think she, she, she typically likes to spend time with me, whether it's conscious or not while she's enduring her menstrual cycle, you know, the menstrual end of the cycle. Um, I'm just, just, just joking there, but uh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably that's probably it. <laughs> that's probably it, right? You know, she wants me to take her out to eat and buy her chocolate. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, yeah. But speaking about women's women's physiology, how do you consider that when, let's say, you have a female athlete when a, when when a female athlete's traveling? How do you consider all of these variables to be as effective as possible in maintaining and optimizing their performance? Yeah, I think female athletes is just kind of recognizing where you're at in the cycle. Um, you know, again, if you're naturally cycling, uh, there's going to be these very uh, predictable hormonal fluctuations that that happen that are going to, um, you know, create changes in, in body temperature, are going to create, um, you know, different nutritional needs, uh, different uh, electrolyte needs. Um, so I think just being aware of it, you can kind of stay ahead of it and you know, there's no reason why at any point in your cycle, you can't, you know, perform at your, you know, at your, to your potential, you know, um, it's just a matter of kind of staying ahead of, of some of the symptoms that can creep up, uh, to make sure that you're, you're maintaining balance. And it's, it's really just around, you know, just knowing in the luteal phase, you probably don't want to fast, for example, um, cause your body is already, um, it's just a really metabolically expensive time. So if you're cutting back or restricting calories, you already need a couple hundred more calories during that time frame. So if you're cutting back or restricting calories, um, that could put more stress on your body, which can interfere with maybe menses or it can interfere with when you, you know, it can maybe delay your period or make your period come early. Um, so yeah, so just understanding kind of the needs across the cycle, I think is is really important source of insight for any female athlete. So they can just kind of stay ahead of it. And, and what kind of difference do you think it makes for a woman athlete or not to be in tune with their cycle and their biometrics on a day-to-day -day basis? What difference will that have on their general health, well-being and uh, quality of life? I mean, I, any human being, frankly, like I, I think should, the science is so good. The technology is so good that, you know, we can give you very reliable insight in terms of your, your, your skin temperature, your, your heart rate, your heart rate variability, you know, these markers that kind of let you know how you're adapting to life's stress, you know, how you're adapting to the food you're putting in your body, how you're adapting to the hydration levels, how you're adapting to training, um, you know, what your sleep looks like, you know, these things that we know are behaviors that we know are going to influence um, your ability to kind of show up and, and be your best version. Uh, you know, the, the the data is there there for us. So I think for for any, you know, any person who's looking to you know, be able to live their values with as much joy and energy as possible. Understanding the trajectory of your health is, I think that's so empowering and, and you know, why, why wouldn't you, you know, want to know? So I think, um, I think these data are there for us and it's just a matter of understanding, you know, how to, uh, uh, understanding like how our behaviors are kind of laddering up to these objective metrics and then, and then be able to make conscious choices about stuff that's like, contributing positively versus stuff that might be detracting from my energy and, and my happiness levels. Um, and then, you know, at that point, like you can really, I, I always say like performance is then kind of a choice, uh, which to me is like super exciting. What my whole entire career has been studying, like my thesis performance is a choice. You know, that was really like that we can choose our performance levels, our attentional capacity, our, our motivation, our effective effort. Like we can really manipulate that with our behaviors, which I think is really exciting. And while we can, while women can measure their biometric data accurately, as far as the devices go, what is there to say about the uh, well ra lack of representation for menstruating women in the research and the overall efficacy of what this data means for them? Right? Because if you look at the vast scope of the research it's done in postmenopausal women, uh, so so what is there to say for the young woman who's looking at her biometric uh, uh, scores? Uh, I love that you highlight, highlight this because, um, yeah, it, the research is scant. Um, and you know, I, I literally just addressed uh, Congress uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on this very topic that we need 
we we know uh, that we're not where we need to be. And and when you you know better, you need to do better. So um, we're definitely trying to change things, ensure that you know the NIH has you know some guardrails in place that uh, you know basically kind of force researchers to include women in their studies. But yeah, I mean, women have been left out of research. And as a result, we don't know as much about female body. I mean, the, you know, women have basically been treated, in, to quote Dr. Stacey Sims, like small men um, in terms of how we train and, um, you know, any and all the considerations that you would normally take or can kind of consider when you're thinking about optimizing training um, have, you know, we've basically taken what we know from men and applied that same, those same principles to women. And as we're learning that's just not the right approach, right? Like we have um, very different things happening hormonally across our, you know, our four week cycle roughly. And, um, and we need to be considering, considering that. So I think at Whoop, we've really tried to take, take the bull by the horns and, and do a lot of research. We have huge amounts of data. We're actually about to launch our women's uh, 2.0 study. Um, we did our 1.0 study uh, like a year and a half ago, analyzed all those data and it was really interesting. We found that, you know, there are very clear uh, for um, HRV and heart rate changes over the course uh, during the follicular phase, which is kind of the low hormone phase versus the luteal phase, which is the high hormone phase. There's a suppression in heart rate variability, an increase in, in heart rate during the luteal phase and the opposite during the follicular phase, which is to suggest that, again, you know, this is a more the luteal phase is more expensive time. Your body is working harder to maintain homeostasis. So we have maybe slightly different training considerations or just, you know, modalities. And we need to kind of shift our modalities a little bit so we can kind of compensate for some of um, these hormonal shifts. And then in, in menses and, and, and um, ovulation, during menses and ovulation, this is a time where women have always been told to kind of, you know, sit back and relax and, you know, take it easy. But actually the opposite is true. This is when we are, we're in our lower hormone phase your body, it's not working as hard to maintain homeostasis. As a result, you have more bandwidth to put toward your your training. So those are really opportunities where women, I think, can really push it and generally feel better, more energetic. Um, so you can put more into your training. So that was, a, a, we published that, that research, which is really exciting. Um, so we've been doing a lot of research in this area to try to level the playing field. Um, obviously, we're not going to make up for the last 30 decades of like no exercise phys research, but but at least we're trying to like make a bit of a dent. Yeah, I've, I've become uh, passionate about this through my girlfriend because her specialty in the health and wellness realm is women's neuropsychophysiology and understanding the female biorhythm. So she's worked closely with Kayla Osterhoff, you know, PhD in women's neuropsychophysiology. She coined the term uh, 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 female biorhythm, and she's a huge fan of uh, Stacey Sims as well. So I just want to say that as a man, I have benefited from knowing her physiology and understanding how she and how, how hormones and everything changes throughout the course of the month. And I think that it's genuinely made our relationship way stronger, more understanding, uh, more empathetic. And I just want to say for the men that are tuning in, like it's a superpower to understand women's neuropsychophysiology and the female biorhythm. Like it's actually, in my opinion, like the most exciting biohack ever. And uh, it's a great way to start a conversation telling a woman, like, I know, you know, I, <laughs> I know what most men don't. <laughs> I, exactly. I, I tell my son that, too. I'm like, this will put you in like point oh 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 one of the population. Like, this is oh, such yeah. a competitive advantage. <laughs> There's nothing yeah, sexier, right? Like, than a guy who, like, understands, like, his partner's, like, body. Like, I mean, that's, like, yeah. amazing. Yeah, I totally agree. An absolute superpower. Guys should be leveraging that. And so, and so what can women expect, let's say from the Whoop platform in the mm. next few months or years with regards to yeah. the unique uh, physiology? Yeah. I mean, we're really going like all in on, um, on, on insights for women. So you mentioned perimenopause and menopause. This is another area that's really not very well understood. You know, I think women have always felt a lot of shame around some of these changes, you know, losing your menstrual cycle. I would imagine, you know, is like can be really hard, you know, like it's just like this new phase of your life. Like there's changes in your sleep. There's change, you know, your circadian rhythms, you know, change. Like there's just these all these really profound shifts in your in your physiology that um, and even in your brain that um, that that really have a have a, you know, can have a, a really traumatic effect on on a woman. So the fact is, we don't we don't know a lot. We don't have a lot of research in this area. Um, that said, uh, we 
our new study, our 2.0 study, is going to include a lot of questions. And we've been gathering a lot of questions around um, perimenopause and menopause, just symptoms, how women are feeling. So a lot of subjective um, insights that we can then kind of uh, look at up against our objective metrics to try to put together, you know, this mind-body interaction so we can kind of tell a better story to help women maybe get through these, these um, you know, these, these tougher kind of phases of, of, of their life of their life. So I think you can expect that we'll have a lot of menopause, perimenopause coaching on our platform. Um, We'll have menstrual cycle coaching, I think is going to get up leveled. You know, we already have menstrual cycle coaching, but, you know, imagine a 2.0 where we're able to track new things. Um, So, you know, not just when you're getting your period, but, you know, fertility and ovulation potentially and, um, and things of that nature. So, I think there's a lot, uh, a lot of exciting stuff that's being uh, researched right now that that hopefully is going to get baked into the experience very soon. Amazing. And if I can make a suggestion, I would love to see some 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 way that men can maybe track their partners and get insights about where they are in their in their cycle and how they might be able to, uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, so support, understand, uh, empathize with their partners. I think that would be quite uh, valuable, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, little- I mean, I get so many direct messages from from guys who are like, oh, my God, you need to help my wife, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. um, like, how can we help my wife, you know? And so I really do empathize with the guys out there who kind of see their partner going through, you know, maybe it's just a really painful period, you know, and, um, like literally <laughs> a painful menstrual cycle or, 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 you know, kind of going through perimenopause and, and experiencing all of these changes and, and hormones. And, um, yeah, so I think there's a lot we can do for, for both, um, both the partner and, and the, the woman who's going through it. Wonderful. And, uh, if I may, I want to ask you a few questions about the way that we rely on data to make decisions and, if and how that can lead to deep states of intuition and physiology. I know that you'll appreciate this word as much as I do, interoception. So that deep bodily awareness. So how how can we use data to eventually achieve this deep bodily awareness? And is that the goal ultimately with something like Whoop or do you guys want to retain people on the data for as long as possible? Or is it a blend or you can share your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a blend. I I am so on the same page as you as just you're talking I you know I I, and this is how I thought about it when I was coaching you know like when we started introducing objective data it totally improved the conversations I had with my athletes because I we had like a a common language and it wasn't about me being like you're tired like why are you showing up you know it's just like I could see okay wow you know sleep is really compromised like or you know what, like, you know, they're just not responding and adapting to the training in like a positive way. Oh, you know what? I just broke up with my boyfriend or, you know what? My grandma's really sick. Like all of a sudden, like this objective data opened up like a more humane conversation. Like I think data, people fear that data is going to detract from these conversations, but I've just found at every turn and I have, a, a th- you know, thousands and thousands of repetitions, like interacting with folks, um, athletes and and CEOs and military operators and spouses of military operators, you know, like uh, just a gazillion of these conversations where data elevates the conversation in a really powerful way um, and helps you understand where to apply your effort. You know, I I think that's the other piece that, you know, there's a there isn't a gazillion things that are going to really move around your mental, physical and emotional capacity for the most part, you know, and in a lot of those things that are going to move it around manifest in the subjective data that we can then say, hey, listen, like you're spending, yeah, nine hours in bed, but but you've got 40 disturbances. Like what's going on? Oh yeah. Like I just, I'm so stressed. Like, I, you know, and all of a sudden you can put together a story and, and then most importantly, help someone understand how to, what, what, what strategies to deploy during the day so they can get the sleep that they need at night, for example. So I, I think, I think from my perspective, like it opens up the door for a, a more humane conversation you know, or, or, and if you're not talking to someone, it just at least gives you a sense of what might be going on so you can then take the appropriate action, right, to, to make it better. Now, I think the other piece is that when you understand, when you have these data, I think to your point, like you, you are more connected to your heart rate and to your body. And 
like I'm at a point where like I don't even need like a secondary like polar sh- heart rate strap. Like I don't need anything on my wrist. Like I can just I can feel the intensity of of my run, and I like know what zone I'm in. You know, <laughs> like just from like all these repetitions of being able to kind of see my workouts retrospectively and kind of see what what heart rate zone I was in. I'm like, all right, like it's like it's it's eliminated the need, I guess, for a lot of extra technology um, because I can feel my body so much more strongly. Right. And in a world that isn't going to call us in when we have high recovery scores, right? We're not (laughs) in a perfect world. We would go to work and we would compete when we have high recovery and high you know good biometrics but how do we optimize for the unexpected nature of uh performing you know it's like if i wake up on a low hrv day and i have to perform what am i supposed to do then and how does the knowledge of this low score how is that going to influence my performance further so what would you what do you do with athletes who wake up have to perform but their scores just aren't there (laughs) their biometrics their body isn't there on the Whoop platform, you can hide your recovery on any day that you want. So I definitely recommend athletes who feel like they're really affected by a lower recovery on game day, just hide it. And and I think folks, I think if that's and I, um physiologically, I, I think it's as you know, it's not it's not really how it works. Like these acute moments where you have you wake up and you've got a lower HRV does not mean you can't PR that day. It does not mean you can't play out of your mind. Of course you can. It's really the sum of all the behaviors leading into that moment, the average of those behaviors that is really going to be the predictor of how you show up. So, you know, any a one-off like low HRV, that is not going to impact your performance. Now, if you've got four days where you're chronically under-recovered because of emotional stress or just you're overtraining, you're underfueling, you're overfueling, you're underhydrating, like that is going to add up and impact you on game day. But if you're generally speaking, tending to all of those things on average, well, it's not going to influence like that one off game day. Oh, wow. I can I can just feel <laughs> the athletes in my audience tuning in right now, taking a breath of fresh air. <laughs> yeah, Don't stress. Yeah. Like, honestly, like it's not it is just it's just every it's it's really every day. You know, that's the cross that I think athletes anyone who's trying to do hard things in in high stress, high stakes environments, the cross that you bear is just doing the right thing every day, right? And just entrusting that, you know, when it's that moment where you actually have to perform, it's everything that you've done in the lead up, like it's going to be there for you on game day. So yeah, I think athletes can just totally take a deep breath and just realize that, hey, I'm a sum of my behaviors and I can bring it whenever I need to. So I know this is a nuanced topic and it goes back to this theme of, you know, uh, some of your behaviors, right? Like if you take the sum of behaviors and and let's say training sessions that you did, you performed on high HRV days versus just training for the sake of training back to back to back or just, you know, whatever, you know, what is the difference there between training on high HRV days and just training because your coach said so? Even if it's, you know, can you make more out of less training sessions with high HRV versus, you know, more frequent sessions on whatever HRV? Yep. Yeah. So we did a, a cool study called Project PR. And, and that's exactly what we found is that the athletes who basically listened to Whoop Recovery um, performed, uh, ran faster when they did this like 5K run. So basically everyone in the in the study was was doing this 5K run. Uh, some some folks were doing just a, um, a non uh, kind of HRV recovery driven program. And the other ones were doing an HRV recovery driven program. So basically, to your point, volume and intensity was modulated based on recovery. And the individuals who modulated their training based on recovery uh, outperformed the folks who didn't. And this has been, um, you know, uh, it, uh, Daniel Plews um, has has some did some research on on looking at this very question. Uh, Martin Bouchette, you know, a lot of like the HRV gurus have have done have basically proven that. Um, that HRV trading, you know, with um, when you're primed to adapt to that load uh, definitely is going to elicit, um, you know, more gains. So, yeah, there's definitely something there. And I just wanted to share that anecdotally, I experimented with this. I was addicted to road cycling and I was very cocky <laughs> when I was road cycling. I just, I just, I, my competitive nature came out on the bike for whatever reason. 
and I was using the Strava app to monitor my performance and I started chasing the KOMs, you know, getting the fastest time for all these different routes. And I started to go and, and cycle a lot less. So rather than the four or five days a week, I was going three days a week and I was leveling up on that bike every single week, nonstop and getting KOMs. And it was all because I was looking at the biometrics. So this is a, just an anecdotal report, but I thought that it was especially helpful for my cocky and competitive nature back then. Um, so for anyone that you know wants to take it to the next level, perhaps you can reference this research and make the best decision about your training based on your HRV. That's fascinating. And uh, what can we do in this moment, for example, to modify our HRV? Let's say you're in a meeting and you find that your stress response is kind of getting out of whack. What can you do in that moment, if anything, to monitor your HRV? Well, we know that slow paced breathing is going to increase your heart rate variability and decrease your, your heart rate. So definitely, you know, a shorter inhale followed by an extended, a longer, longer exhale will, uh, will bring your heart rate down. So just doing a few cycles of that, uh, can definitely, you know, modulate your, your heart rate right there and make you feel less stressed. Um, you can do a cyclical a cyclic sigh, which is a double inhale followed by an extended exhale. Um, that has Pure been shown. Sigh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they used whoop in that study. That was, uh, we were no the biometric. way, get out of here. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. We're actually spinning up our second study with those, with his lab. Um, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. He's a science advisor to whoop. So we, we love Andrew Huberman. Um, I had no idea. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, that's amazing. Eh, I, he's a good friend. Um, yeah, he's, he's amazing. He wasn't always famous. So, you know, I, I yeah. met him when he wasn't famous, but, um, but he's, yeah, he's really phenomenal, obviously. Um, and has just totally changed, I think our world, the high performance oh, world abs- in such a positive absolutely. way. Yeah. Just making it accessible. But, um, but yeah, so the physiological side, the cyclic side, which is a double inhale followed by an extended exhale, um, also has been shown to reduce anxiety and stress as as he um, demonstrated in, in that beautiful paper published in Cell. Um, so, you know, do that 10 times. That will totally bring you down and kind of get you back back in balance. And I, and I think what I think folks don't recognize is that the degree to which we go throughout the day just chronically activated. So, you know, if we think about the parasympathetic nervous system, which is so heart rate variability is a function of the heart, originates in the autonomic nervous system, which has two branches, the parasympathetic sympathetic. They're both competing to send signals to the heart. Um, when we're really stressed, right, sympathetic is going to dominate, right? Your high heart rate, adrenaline, adre- you know, cortisol, epinephrine. And you can imagine if that's happening across the day, um, we accumulate kind of negative stress. And that negative stress impacts ends up uh, rearing its head. We might be so sleepy we fall asleep, but invariably, you know, those are the folks who are waking up at 2 a.m. It's kind of unresolved stress during the day or kind of, you know, just chronic stress throughout the day. So you really want to try to interrupt um, moments of stress with like bouts of rest or, you know, moments of activation with moments of deactivation. And breath is a great way to to do that. And And so... If, you've, if you're in a situation where you're chronically stressed, you will see a lower baseline heart rate variability, right? If you're managing stress really proactively, you'll see that, it, you know, your heart rate variability should should improve. So that is one way to modify it, I guess, is, is what I'm getting at. And uh, what are some of the, what's some of the low-hanging fruit that you tend to see with people that have this low-grade chronic stress? Why is it there? And, and maybe what can they do to counter that and put their bodies in a better recovery and and performance mode. Understanding kind of the root of the stress or the anxiety, you know, anxiety is really kind of this chronic worry. Um, So if you've got chronic worry, the the only way to kind of address it is to deal with it, right? You kind of have to get to the source. So, you know, sometimes that means you got to talk to a professional, right? And try to figure out, okay, why, why, why am I anxious? Like, what is this, you know, what is making me uh, feel this kind of, you know, chronic worry and, and how is that chronic worry manifesting in my behaviors? You know, is that, how am I, uh, what are the behaviors that I'm adopting to try to, um, you know, mitigate that anxiety? And invariably a lot of folks will, you know, take over the counter medications. They'll maybe 
you know, binge eat or, um, you know, well, it, it can manifest in just, you know, lashing out at, at a partner or a child or, you know, like, you know, anxiety can be and, and you know, can be really, really tough. Um, you know, and stress is, is kind of just like these uh, more kind of acute moments where we're just kind of stressed, like, oh, I've got this deadline and I'm just like stressed and I'm like having to like mobilize resources to like do this thing. Um, so stress and anxiety are are fundamentally different, uh, as, as you know, and and need to be kind of I think treated differently. So um, I think getting to the root of you know whether it's chronic stress or, or anxiety uh, is really important. And once you kind of get to the root of it, I think it's adopting behaviors that will kind of increase your tolerance for stress, right? Because stress isn't going to go away. It's just the nature of modernity. But if you think about it in from the standpoint of how do I put as little um, extra stress on my body as possible, right? And and a lot of that is is actually related to these circadian things. So when we are misaligned with the natural light dark cycle in terms of our meal timing and exercise, and when we're viewing light, when we're restricting light, uh, when we're eating, when when that's out of sync, we put a ton of stress on our body. So any other stress that we layer on top, we can't handle. <laughs> Right. So at a base level, you want to try to just allow your body to operate as efficiently and naturally as possible. And a lot of that is comes down to making sure we see light, you know, within 20 minutes of waking up. Right. It's really important to get our kind of sleep wake times again, really stable and how when we view light is going to facilitate whether or not we can actually stabilize when we go to bed and when we, when we wake up. So when I see light in the morning, is going to influence actually when I feel sleepy at night. So that's really important for folks to understand. And then restricting light in the lead up to bed is really important, right? That's the only way to release melatonin, that like sleepy hormone. And, you know, it needs darkness in order to be released. And melatonin isn't just about making us sleepy. It has neuroprotective effects. It has it, it, it has such wide ranging, has a wide ranging impact on every cell tissue and organ in our body. And um, when we don't release it, that is, we push past our natural pressure for sleep. Um, we end up not releasing, you know, as much melatonin as we should. And that has short term and long term consequences. So, again, stabilizing sleep wake and making sure that we're viewing light appropriately will definitely decrease the amount of stress we put on our body, increase our tolerance for stress um, which is going to allow us kind of a, to adapt to um, all the demands in our life in a more functional way. Um, the other thing that the other behavior that puts huge amounts of stress in our body is eating after the sun goes down, which I don't think folks really realize. But um, when there's lots of really good research on just um, metabolic outcomes and early eaters versus late eaters, and you really want to try to eat a bulk of your calories early in the day. Um, because that's when we're most primed to metabolize food and utilize nutrients. Um, and when we uh, uh, eat uh, big meals close to bedtime, we're basically diverting resources that would typically go to recovery and rejuvenation to digestion. So that puts, again, a lot of stress, a lot of metabolic stress on the body. So um, late meal times, uh, lots of light during the day. And when you wake up, restricting light at night uh, in the lead up to bed. So, so critical. Mitigating stress throughout the day with some breathing, really important. Um, and then exercising, you know, I think if we exercise really late at night, um, that can, it can make it really hard to fall asleep. Um, and if we're certainly, if we're working out enough, like Planet Fitness and it's like super, you know, lit, uh, again, that can impact our ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. So just like trying to be conscientious of when we exercise. That said, the benefits of exercise are so profound that, you know, it, it's probably better to take a knock on sleep potentially and exercise. I don't know. I go back and forth on that, but yeah. <laughs> well, so what, uh, essentially what you're describing in, in, in a nutshell, like in the, in the grand scheme, at least the way that I see it is you're using data to try and maintain a biologically consistent lifestyle in the modern day, because these are cues and these are behaviors that we would otherwise do naturally at consistent times throughout the day when they made sense. And so because we have the convenience of being detached nowadays, we often forget how important it is to understand and honor our evolutionary to preserve mechanisms, our physiology, the way that it's designed. Listen, we haven't adapted, right, 
to 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 blue light, for example, after the sun goes down, um, we haven't adapted to eating at all hours of the day. Like we just have it, you know, and the result is metabolic dys- dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, um, infertility. You know, these have real like huge effects on on, um, you know, on on humans. So, yeah, we just need to fight identity, honestly, and try to put some of these guardrails in place so we can preserve our health. Yeah, I mean, uh, our technology evolves exponentially faster than our physiology. So we have to, you know, make the opposite, equal and opposite effort to protect ourselves and uh, live the best life that we can. And I know we only have a couple of minutes left here, but I, I wanted to share this with you. I have um, a prediction as to why an earlier meal can improve sleep beyond the circadian uh, consideration. And it's because when we, have more time between our dinner and the time we fall asleep, we can essentially guarantee a deeper state of ketosis approaching bedtime. And from what I understand with my background in exercise physiology, you get this shift in the respiratory quotient, a downward shift in the respiratory quotient. You are technically, you have lower breaths per minute. And as a result, literally you have greater parasympathetic activity. So that can boost your HRV. And actually I tested this further. I'd start to see earlier, you know, meal times and I started to sleep way better to your point, but what took it to the next level was exogenous ketones uh, by a brand called Ketone Aid, which I think most of the Tour de France teams take. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I started taking this stuff and I'm, I'm not kidding you with just six hours of sleep. I got the same recovery as my typical seven and a half to nine hours. It was insane. Wow. Like the nights that I can't getting into deeper stages afford, of sleep. Yeah. Oh yeah. The nights that I can't afford many hours of sleep, I take this stuff and I feel great in the morning. So I don't know if you guys have looked at that at all, but I thought it was extreme, extremely interesting. Well, that was a beautiful explanation of the mechanism. Um, but yeah, there, there's no question about it. A late meal will increase your respiratory rate to your point. So we see elevation in, in respiratory rate and respiratory rate is like a relatively stable metric. It doesn't really move around that lot, a lot, but even just like subtle you know, in, you know, shifts in, in respiratory rate actually has a pretty profound impact. Right. So, um, yeah. So late meals is like early meals, like ending your last calorie a few hours before bed is the best hack for mod- modifying heart rate variability. Because to your point, like you're able to then put all of your resources, like you're not because digestion is is a parasympathetic activity. Right. So when we're asking our, our, our we're asking our heart to uh, when we're asking our nervous system to digest, you know, help digest food, it can't do all the other regenerative uh, and recovery kind of processes that it would that it would like to do. <laughs> so you're kind of competing for resources when you're trying to digest and also sleep at the same time. Right, your nervous system is preoccupied, um, and uh, I, I want to get your take on this too, which is the the temperature consideration of a late meal. You know, you have all this blood pulling into the uh, your midsection, and that keeps you from getting the decline in core body temperature that actually helps drive sleep. Right, it's actually the decline in core body temperature that is one of the main drivers of sleep, if I'm not mistaken. And so, do you think that the that the actual uh, food itself is maintaining that that higher core body temperature? Have you guys looked at that too, or am I just totally making this up and making Inferences based on my yeah. Well, digestion background. digestion elevates your your body temperature. That yeah. So and, and we know for sleep you need a decrease in in body temperature, right? In order to kind of get into deeper stages of sleep. So this is kind of what you're seeing too. Again, when you're having to digest food, you have an elevation in respiratory rate. You have an elevation in body temperature. Both you know not optimal for getting into deeper stages of sleep. Um. So yeah. Well, Kristen, I know that we're pretty much out of time here. I have one last question for you, uh, just briefly. If you could put a word, sentence, or statement on a billboard somewhere in the world, what would it say and where would you put it? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> uh, I, I'd i probably say performance is a choice, which might like piss some people off, but but that's, that's probably what I'd say. Like I and I, I guess I would maybe want something that's like, you know, you have to kind of click into that and like understand what it means. But I think that people have a lot more agency than they think. And I think just that mindset that, you know what, like there's a lot of things that I can choose 
on a day-to-day basis that are going to enable me to perform at a level that I feel really good about. And, you know, a lot of those things are are stuff that are democratically available, right? It's just a matter of kind of creating a life where you can um, where you can create that, you know, synchronization, I suppose, and that alignment. Um, so, yeah, performance is a choice. Amazing. Well, it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you on the Know Your Physio podcast. I think that you are, without a doubt, one of the uh, best fit professionals for our show because you can really, you're so good at taking this uh, science and making it actionable, accessible, and showing people that, in fact, it is a choice to apply this and to level up with it and through it. And uh, we can't thank you enough for joining us here today, Chris, and it's been such an honor and pleasure. 